So we get this on tape too. So, uh, yeah. We're talking about the median, I told you last week that there was some uh, crap in the version of the compendium that I made last year. So it's that, that was what I posted on the net. Um, and it happens here just before example uh, one one. So I'm just going to correct this uh, on media. So I say here we define the median as the, yeah we as I did we order the values and then take the middle one or the average of the two middlemost values. Then I say something that is not true. Um, I say that the number the median is characterized by the property that the percentage of data points less than or equal to m is equal, always the same as the percentage of data points greater than or equal to m. So that's not true, in fact. And then I have an example where I sort of miraculously enough make the same mistake. So I take that as an illustration of my false statement. So I don't know what happened here, but it must not have been my best day when I was doing this last year sometime. So I, in the new version of the compendium that will be probably out next week, I have deleted this sentence. And if you look at this example, let's see what is wrong here. So it's an example where we compute the median of a data set. You can look at that. Um, these are the XI observations and if you sort them, you get this list down here and where are the middlemost values? These two. So the average of 26 and 26 is 26, so the median is 26, right? You just sort them like this, go to the middle and take what you find. Um, but then I say we note that 8 out of 12 values are less than or equal to m. This is correct. And similarly, 8 values are greater than or equal to m. Okay. That's just 7 values. So it actually is the proof that my sentence above is wrong and yeah. So something wrong happened, but yeah. So note this because it might be, not that it's that important, but it's, I want it to be correct anyway. Okay. So we talked about measures of central tendency. We have the mean, the median, and we know some potential dangers of using the, uh, the mean in case of extreme observations. So there are basically two very important things that we want to measure if we have a set of data, a set of observations. Okay, this is nice and symmetrical, so it might make sense to talk about the mean. And the second thing that is very important is the variability of the data. And this is measured by standard deviation. Or normally it's measured by standard deviation. So. I don't have a definition of the standard deviation in, this, in these slides. It's of course in the compendium there, but we can write it down. What you do is you look at the average here, and here are values x1, 
x2, x3, x4, and so on. And you take, for all observations, you take the difference to the mean, and you square this, so you get a positive number on both sides, whether xi is less than or greater than x bar. And you note that this number is larger than further away from x bar you are. So it will be fairly large for x2, while it's fairly small for this one as well. So you sum all of these numbers and you divide by n minus 1. So it's more or less, you might say, it's the average of these square deviations from the mean. Um, if it was the average, we would divide by n, but we are dividing by n minus 1 for some technical reasons that we maybe don't need to care about. So this is something we compute from the data. It's called S square. So it's actually the sample variance is called. And what we call S is simply the square root of this guy. It's called the sample standard deviation. So it's a very important measure in descriptive statistics and in estimation. It's very important. Right, the standard deviation, it has some of the same dangers as the mean has in terms of being sensitive to things like this. So, if you want to describe typical income in Molde and you want to describe the typical income variation and some person like this enters into your sample your standard deviation will be way too high uh, compared to what you are wanting to talk about. So, it's far more common than what is called the interquartile range, which I will tell you about in a few seconds. But it's, the standard deviation is sensitive to extreme values. We should just know about that also. Okay. So, what is this interquartile range? Is a different measure of variation. It's also quite intuitive. Take like this your data. sort of somewhere on the line like this. So these are xi's. And then we have quartiles. Quar quartiles, they are called q1, q2, q3. And now we want to find q1 is going to be what cuts off 25% of the data points to the left, basically. So, assuming that this goes up with the numbers, suppose this is 25% of the data, then we put Q1 here. Similarly, the third quartile, as it's called, is going to be, so say, one, two, three, four. I haven't counted the numbers here, so it doesn't necessarily make perfect sense, but I'll give you the idea. So you cut some 25% of data here. And then somewhere here you have the 
second quartile, which divides the remaining part in 25% and 25%. Uh, mm? Okay. Right, you're damn right. It's exactly the median. So the middle quartile is the same as the median, but we have two other quartiles. So they are called quartiles because they cut in four the data set in terms of number of observations. So this is the median here. And the interquartile range is this span here. I mean, I, you're not going to see so much of that in this course, but it's okay to know what it is. Maybe it's used sometimes in papers you're going to read and something. So. Ah, yeah, right. So, difference from here to here. That's good. Okay. So here are something we call dot plots. We see the population there. The other variable is the, uh, for my sample of countries, the average female life, female, female life expectancy in 1995 in terms of years. So both of these distributions are slightly what we call skewed. They have some skewness. Um, and the most dramatic case is the population variable. Okay. Yeah. Okay. This is something that is quite uh, important and very useful as a, as a rule of thumb. And it's maybe not obvious at the moment for many of you why this could be any useful. But I will tell you soon. So if you're data or your, the variable that you are interested in is of a distribution that is fairly symmetric and something like a normal distribution, uh, which we are going to talk about maybe next week. It means that the data have some sort of probability distribution looking like this. So you will see some nice concentration in the middle here and then a sort of an equal spread to two sides and nothing like over here or anything like that. If it is behaving nice like this, then the interval from x bar to and plus minus two standard deviation will typically contain 95% of the values of this variable. So if I compute my x bar here and s would typically then be something like this. And if I take 2s, you get to x bar plus 2s here. And similarly to x bar minus 2s, 
then we know that this interval will contain a vast majority of the values that we see for this variable. So one very simple application of this is for, we, we, can, we are going to do this a li little bit better and a bit more precise, but it's very nice to have this rule of thumb in your mind when you t someone talks about the, the mean and the standard deviation, you immediately have an idea where the values are going to land in this, in this uh, situation. So, for instance, suppose x is, or xi, I won't call it maybe, okay, let, let's call it demand, and it's equal to number of customers. at the restaurant. Um, when you run a restaurant, you always have this problem that you don't really know on any given day how many customers are going to show up. So you have to plan for some sort of uncertainty here. So what you're going to do is probably to look at the history of, say, Saturdays, if this is a Saturday. You know, of course, that the demand is different on different weekdays, but on Saturday you have a historical set of observations. So suppose you observe this for a number of Saturdays and you compute x bar equal to say 140. So it's not a huge restaurant, but still there is need for planning. This equals 25. So what you might um, want if there is some special day that you have a very high demand, you might want to be able to serve it. Um, suppose you put your capacity, I mean, and the capacity is, is of course, what can you plan the capacity? You can at least plan how many waiters you want to hire for this Saturday. You can plan something about the food you will be able to, to produce, and so on. So, so what are the maximum capacity that you want to be able to handle here? You don't want it to be able to serve 200 customers because it never happens. So you're going to have waiters just standing and smoking and... Oh, there are too many waiters. So where are you going to put the capacity target or...? Well, this rule of thumb says that at least 95% of the values will be below or between actually here, so that means if it's symmetrical, you know that 97.5% um, of Saturdays um, will have this than x bar plus 2s demand, which is uh, 140 plus 50, that's 190 customers. So, and here you need to decide, okay, I can say, I, if I put my capacity here, theoretically, I will be able to to cover the demand on 
almost all Saturdays, except a few extreme days. And, and then a few days you might just have to s close the doors or turn off a few customers, but mainly you will be okay with this. And then clearly this is logistics in a way, so you, you want to you might want to change this to say 90. Say I'm going to accept to be uh, undercapacitated on 10% of Saturdays. Where can I put my 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 capacity? Well, I don't have the number exactly in my head, but this is going to be something like x bar plus something times s. So you can, by using reasonable probability distribution, we can determine from the x bar how much above the, the mean should you go to be able to cover 90% of days in terms of demand. Um, Yeah. So we will get back to this in more detail in coming weeks. But this is one very important use of um, of these estimates, x bar and s. Okay, so then we have um, central tendency with mean and median. We have uh, sample variation with uh, mainly standard deviation, sometimes interquartile range. Then there is another very important descriptive measure, which is called correlation. And you more or less, you all know about correlation, I guess. But we're going to do it carefully anyway. So, you can look at this picture. It shows the it shows two, two variables, so it's an x variable and a y variable and the x variable is the female life expectancy in a country. Up to, I think there are 109 countries in the sample. Um, Y variable is the percentage urbanization in the corresponding country. So each dot here represents one country and the X coordinate is the female life expectancy and the Y coordinate is the percentage of people in urban areas. So uh, formally this data look like this. So what you see here is some tendency that the higher the female life expectancy is, the higher the urbanization is. It's not a very strong pattern, but it is what we call correlation here. So I'm just going to review how do we measure the strength of such relation. Um, well. Or let me draw this here. X and Y. Um, so we have some data here. Like this. 
these are x's. X. X R. Okay, let me not draw too much here. Okay, so here somewhere is the average y value, and here somewhere is the average x value. Um, this picture indicates what we call positive correlation. I guess you all agree to that. The higher x is, the higher we tend to see y. But how do we specifically measure that, say, mathematically? Well, what we do is we take for each xi and the corresponding yi. Um, We multiply together the differences of, I mean, the de deviations from the mean, like this, okay? So I can call this di if I like. And in a case with positive correlation, means typically um, typically the deviation with the x from the mean and the deviation from for the y, y variable have same what same sign So, if x is greater than the average x, if xi is greater than the average x, then typically also the corresponding yi is greater than the, the y bar. So they are both positive, these differences. Or the other typical point is something down here, xj, yj. So here xj minus x bar is negative, and then the corresponding difference here also is negative, right? So they have the same sign in both cases. And if you multiply two numbers with the same sign, you get something positive, okay? So, This implies under positive correlation, typically xi minus x bar times yi minus y bar is positive. That implies if you take, if you sum them, Make some space before the sum because I'm going to put something there. But if you sum them, you're going to have something positive, right? You sum a lot of numbers that are typically positive, the sum will be typically positive also. And the stronger the correlation, the more of these factors will have the same sign you might imagine. So this is positive, and it's going to be positive even if I divide by n minus 1. So I'm basically taking the average of the products that I call di here. Okay, so what I'm saying, this is just to sort of justify that this is the m a measure of of uh, covariation. So if I take my data, I do this summation and I find something that is very positive, I have a sign of strong positive correlation. And then you may just take a quick check to see that if you have negative correlation, the picture will look something like this. You have the average y here, the average x here. 
And if I pick an xi that is larger than my average, I will typically find the yi that is below the average y. So for negative correlations, these two guys will typically have different sign. If you multiply them together, you typically get a negative number. And this guy here will be typically negative. So this is what we call the covariance. of x and y. Okay, so we're not quite done with the covariance because um, because it's somewhat hard to interpret because we don't know if we compute the covariance and we find 7,000. We do not know exactly if this is a strong or weak correlation because it's it's going to be dependent on the unit of our variables so um, what we need is actually the correlation coefficient okay so let's agree to call the covariance we call it s x y it's just this sum here. Um, the correlation coefficient is called Rxy. And it's just Sxy divided by Sx times Sy, where Sx and Sy are the standard deviations of the x and y data sets individually. x and y data. I'm quite sure that all of you, almost all of you, have seen this some, uh, some time before, uh, but I'm repeating it anyway. So the, the main reason, I mean, this, you know this, this correlation coefficient, it will be always between minus 1 and plus 1. Um, and if it's close to plus 1, we have what we call a strong positive correlation. If it's close to minus 1, it means a strong negative correlation. And if it's closer to zero, it means something more diffuse and not strongly related. And then I say, uh, I don't specify here, I think I mentioned in the compendium, but I can repeat it. That the, The problem with the, the covariance is that it's actually unit dependent. So if you compare, for instance, say, this is the interest rate in a country, and this is the um, say whatever GD, um, GDP per capita. And um, you compute the covariance. It will be dependent on whether you use US dollars or Norwegian kroner or pounds 
or whatever for this variable. Okay, interest rate has a more well-defined unit in any country. It's going to be percentage. Um, but if this is income, if it's uh, GDP or something, this covariance will uh, depend on the unit. E.g. of monetary variables. Or notoriously the American or the European weight and length and measurement system with inches and centimeters and pounds and kilos and stuff. Uh, if you talk covariances, it will be very difficult to compare a scientific paper written with European measurements to one written with American measurements. Because you would have to convert these figures all the time. So for instance, if you say that the, the covariance in, if you use Norwegian kroner as the monetary unit, will be something like six times the covariance that you get if you just convert all the figures to US dollars, because the dollar is approximately six kroner. Yeah. But if you take an American analysis of the relation between GDP and interest rate, and you take a Norwegian, um, and you report the, the correlation between these variables. It's totally comparable. So it eliminates all problems with units if you use correlation. Yeah. Okay. We have a little bit more time. So We talked a bit about the visualization of data. Now we talked something about key measures. So we have the mean, median, the standard deviation, the interquartile range. I can call it ER for brief. And correlation coefficients. So these are important key figures. Now let's look a little bit about the graphics. Um, of course, when the correlation is your uh, your uh, point of interest, the reasonable graphic thing is to use a scatter plot like this. It immediately shows you how the x and y data could be related. This picture. I used a small r up there, but the correlation coefficient for this data is something like seven, 0 0.74. So it's actually a fairly, fairly substantial correlation in those data. Um, yeah. We could look at something if I mm, I'm allowed to just go to the compendium, show you something called I mean the dot plot we have seen that was the with the population and the female life expectancy. You just put dots along the axis to represent observations. Let's check that, so say it's okay. Then a box plot, let me see if I can find this, what is called a box plot. I'm gonna go into the companion. There's the dot plot, by the way, or two of them. So they, they are nice uh, representations of the, uh, 
of one variable's distribution on the line. So you have probably read, read something in this compendium. Here is all the gory details of what I did here regarding the correlation and stuff. Here's the scatter plot. Here's something that is nice uh, just to digress. Things like this is very easy to do with SPSS. You want to make the dot plot of urbanization and split it on the categorical variable, which is uh, geographical region. And then you get this nice picture here, um, showing some demographical differences between, between regions. And here is a different way of uh, representing the same picture, same kind of um, differences. Uh, so what does a dot plot do? Oh, I mean a box plot. This is a box plot. What are the boxes there? So there's kind of an axis here and there is maybe uh, category A here, which is for instance OECD, and then it looks something like uh, this. So, would you guess what this tells us? Eh? No, it's uh, maybe not easy to guess, but what it shows you is the minimum. So it's, it's a very sort of rough summary of the data. This is the minimum. This is the... Okay. For the sake of video, let me put it a little bit bigger. This is the first quartile here. This is the median also known as the second quartile. And this is the third quartile, and this is the maximum. <coughs> so it sort of immediately tells you something about the, the shape of this data set. And uh, we maybe not use this so much, but you sometimes see this in reports also. Uh, in this case, if there are extreme observations, they are sort of taken out and given a special place because it sort of distorts the general picture that we are wanting to see. So in the Middle East region, for instance, there is one country which is extremely low on urbanization. Um, and it's a number 75 on it. That means it's going to be in line 75 in my SPSS file. So I can go in and check which country it is. Should we do that? Just for fun. Egypt. 75, Egypt. Really surprising. Um. So it's 44% urbanization. Is it making sense? No, it uh, that doesn't make sense. There was another observation more done. Yeah, it, it may in fact be, uh, I think I probably sorted my data set here on some other variable after I made this picture. So what is, was 75 is not anymore 75. Um. Okay, let's let's not uh, go into that now. You can just trust me that this works, but not after you sort the data, of course. We can make again the box plot in SPSS. Hmm? We can make again the box plot in SPSS together. 
out. Yeah, we can do that, but I don't want to do that now, I think. Um, there was maybe one more thing I wanted to say just. Well, this is histogram. <coughs> histogram here. Let's uh, just talk about that on Tuesday, right? We have a lecture on Tuesday at uh, two o'clock, and I'm not going to take those pictures that I took of you. I'm going to count the number of students, and we have a very nice room with a fixed camera that that can take about seventy students. Um, so we shouldn't be too much about this, because then we have trouble with that. Thing. But check on Frontier which room we are going to use. If it's not, um, yeah, I, if there doesn't come any information, we just follow the original plan, right? And just to make sure, this is the final sort of lecture today, so we're, we're stopping here now.